So hi, welcome to this episode of History Hunters. It's an absolutely gorgeous day here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're specifically on the other side of the hill from Oakland and those places. We're here in Martinez, California. We're going to visit the home of actually the 14-room mansion of John Muir, who was the famous conservationist, writer, botanist who helped Congress in 1890 establish Yosemite National Park as a place where people would be able to come and enjoy for many years without it being destroyed. John Muir was all over the place. When he came to the United States, he explored everywhere. He did a 1,000 mile trip from Kentucky all the way down to Florida. Then he went on a trip to Havana, Cuba. Then he came over to California. He fell in love with California. The first thing he wanted to do was see Yosemite National Park. And he fell in love with the place. So he pretty much established a lot of his life here in California. The reason that he lived in Martinez, California is that his wife's father was Dr. John Strunzel. He was a famous physician. He also owned a 2,600 acre fruit ranch, which John Muir helped to manage. So he lived in the house. We're also gonna try to visit the grave of John Muir and his wife, which is not very far from the mansion. So join us for a fascinating look at the mansion and the man on this episode. The National Historic Site is located at 4202 Alhambra Avenue in Martinez, California. Visitors are greeted by two historical markers in the parking lot, one for the Muir House, the other for the Vicente Martinez Adobe. To gain access to the home, visitors must go through the small visitor center with a number of displays, this one detailing the National Historic Sites of the Bay Area. Like most national sites, the John Muir Mansion sells a number of souvenirs to visitors, including caps and shirts, books and bookmarkers, note cards, refrigerator magnets, window stickers, coffee mugs and water bottles, lapel pins, keychains, arm patches, even Christmas tree ornaments. Talk to him. Talk to him? What am I going to say to him? Tell him thank you for preserving Yosemite. <laughs> Thank you for preserving your So here it is. We are, have arrived at the John Muir house, actually the John Strutzel mansion. And I guarantee you it didn't look like that. All paved here when he was here. This was in the middle of a 2,600 acre fruit ranch. There's the four freeway over there. And there's a railroad trestle across the way as well. It's really uh, a beautiful 14 room Victorian, been nicely preserved. Of course, there's a famous picture of John standing right over there with his wife and his daughters. These must be original doors. It's got that old house smell. <laughs> that old house smell. This must be a parlor room where the family would gather in evenings. The home's east parlor is dominated by a large brick fireplace which Muir installed when the smaller original was demolished by the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. He was pleased with it, writing to a friend, quote, I built a big fireplace, almost suitable for mountaineers, into which I roll a jolly pair of logs two feet in diameter and pile a half dozen smaller ones between and back of them, making fires that flame and roar and radiate sunny heat. Bunch of pictures of John Muir on this table. And of course, here's Hetch Hetchy, the, the valley that he couldn't save. Is this the spot where you stood? What's that? Yeah. There's uh, Teddy and John Muir, Glacier Point. That's where you went. You were almost make, giving me the willies standing there. Well, that's why we went there that day, was yes. so you could stand in that spot. Yep. Check out the episode. Hey, this
this is freaking me out again. Get back. Just get back. Get back. You want to stay here and I'll go over there and take a picture of the gang going off of that? Not really. Why is it? It makes you nervous? Yes, very. Why? There's a picture of the outing. That's probably also a glacier. No, I don't know. It could be, yeah, it could be a glacier point. Who knows? There's the train trestle that cut through the property. Apparently John Muir agreed to allow that railroad to come through here so he could ship out the produce here grown at this, at this ranch, this fruit ranch. 2,600 acres. Gene Carr met John Muir in 1861 and they struck up a lasting friendship as both loved nature. It was Carr who introduced Muir to the Strenzel family, which led to his marriage to Louisa in 1880 and ultimately two daughters. Another good friend was John Burroughs, one of America's foremost nature writers. I'll discuss him later in the video. We're gonna go up the staircase here and see what we can find. I'm assuming this is John's bedroom. John Muir had five sisters and two brothers as adults. The Muir siblings lived all over the country, but they wrote to each other frequently and visited whenever possible. He ultimately convinced two of his siblings, Margaret and David, to bring their families to Martinez and help run the ranch. So when Muir's oldest daughter Wanda left for college, her younger sister Helen filled their shared room with their favorite things, which were trains. Helen filled her diaries with notes about trains that puffed by the house. She befriended the railroad workers and stopped at the local station. She even ordered technical manuscripts to fuel her curiosity. But she did so under the name of H.L. Muir. Helen didn't think publishers would send such materials to girls. Here's another bedroom. I don't know whose bed this is, but there's a man suit. It's quite possible this is John Muir's room. There's also a top hat there. You can imagine John Muir standing right here overlooking the beautiful little ranch that they had here. I wonder what he'd think of it today. He probably would be shocked to see a 7-Eleven across the street. Now this is the room that I remember. It was his study and uh, see papers scattered all throughout the floor. His typewriter there, one of those old-fashioned lamps. Muir spent long hours in his upstairs study, which he called the Scribble Den. He found the room to be sunnier than the downstairs paddle library that was used by his father-in-law. Louisa Muir liked her notoriously untidy husband to work upstairs because she didn't want guests seeing his piles of books and papers. Muir would often write magazine articles and books here, using the desk that is one of the few original pieces of furniture in the house. Composing didn't come easy to Muir, for he once wrote, quote, Writing was like the life of a glacier, one eternal grind, and it was less lucrative than the family fruit business. John Muir would correspond with the country's movers and shakers in this room. One of them was Theodore Roosevelt, who accompanied Muir to Yosemite in his famous 1903 visit. This is one of the letters that the president wrote to John Muir. John Muir rallied to save Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite from efforts to build a dam to store water and generate power for San Francisco. However, the fight was lost in Congress and when President Woodrow Wilson signed the Raker Act in December 1913. A very disappointed John Muir, it is said, died of a broken heart on Christmas Eve 1914. Truth is, he died from pneumonia in a Los Angeles hospital. There's a fireplace that he would warm himself by. And uh, they've removed the handles for some reason, but you can tell it's pretty old. John Muir was a very studied individual. He had some formal educational training, but uh, it's amazing what he learned through his studies of 
natural phenomena, flora and fauna. And his influence was wide. He was able to capture the attention of presidents, congressional leaders, governors. Here's an actual self-portrait. This is how he saw himself. Like a wild man. Apparently he didn't keep razors handy. I always like the look of the doorknobs. I wonder if they're original and uh, imagine the occupants placing their hand there. This is Helen Muir's recipe book. The spacious kitchen of the home is equipped with a coal and wood burning stove installed when the house was built in 1883. Although Louisa Muir was a good cook, most meals were prepared by Chinese cook Ah Fong, who worked for the Muir family for many years. Like the rest of the house, the kitchen depended on gas lighting and heating. Muir didn't add electricity until 1912, just two years before his death. I would imagine that good old John Muir would walk out the back here and head off there and head off to take care of the trees that he had to take care of here. This has changed so much. He probably would scarcely recognize this property. And uh, I have to think that he would be cringing at how things turned out in California for sure. He obviously loved this area. It was a little bit inland, so it was a little bit hot. But this is uh, just a very splendid house that I'm glad that they took care of and preserved. The house was built in 1882 by Dr. John Strenzel, John Muir's father-in-law. When Dr. Strenzel died in 1890, Mrs. Strenzel invited the Muirs to move into the, quote, big house with her. This was John Muir's home for the last 24 years of his life. The house originally had two water closets, but one was removed by John Muir in 1906. Water for the indoor plumbing was provided by rainwater collected from the roof or pumped in from one of the three wells outside the house and stored in redwood tanks in the attic. Any overflow went to the large brick cistern located under the kitchen floor. Sometime after 1890, John Muir added a three-story addition to the back of the house that supports a large steel water tank in the attic. The house has remained largely unaltered structurally since Muir's time. Now on these grounds are olive trees that were planted around 1910, if you can believe it. Some of the oldest olive trees in the National Park System are growing on Mount Wanda. Wanda was the name of one of John Muir's daughters. This is how this ranch looked way back. Here's a windmill. I overheard a ranger inside the house say that uh, there used to be a fish pond out here. Not a natural fish pond, but one that they made. But this is how you got water way back. You didn't have a municipal water system. You just had to pump it out of the ground. Probably the best tasting water that you could find. So there's the historic carriage house. Dates back to the 1890s. And uh, you can imagine that John Muir would actually get in his buggy or walk out of here. And if this is the old road, that's how they went. Right behind the house on their way to different places. There's some grapevines over there. I wonder if John Muir drank some wine. According to this, John Muir planted three main varieties of grapes. They were the Flame Tokay, Muscat of Alexandria, and the Zinfandel variety. And I wonder if these are plants that date back to his time or offspring. Muir never owned an automobile and preferred to walk whenever possible, but the Muir Strenzel Ranch had at least three horse-drawn buggies that the family used to travel around the Alhambra Valley the buggy that we see here was owned by a local rancher. This was actually constructed in 1891 with large front doors to admit the carriages. Now, if I'm not mistaken, John Muir probably brought a seedling back from the mountains that he visited. That looks like a huge sequoia tree that he brought back from the hills. Who knows, maybe Sequoia National Park? So we have a very small pomegranate growing on this tree. And according to the sign down here, Dr. Stressel first planted pomegranates in the 1860s and John Muir continued to grow them over the years. After receiving directions to the Muir gravesite from a park ranger, we took off down Alhambra Avenue. A wrong turn had me driving down the wrong road skirting the small cemetery. 
That is where we saw this metal artwork that had to have been a representation of John Muir and a pack mule. This is really the weirdest setup for a grave I've ever seen, where you've got to go through this residential area and then it's locked certain hours and then they've got a path. Oh, it's, it's right here. John Muir is buried right here. That's crazy. I mean, John Muir is legendary, especially in Yosemite National Park. So John is buried up front with his, his uh, wife, Louise. So it looks like there's actually nine people buried here. There would be Muir's eldest daughter, Wanda Muir Hanna, 1881 to 1942. Then their son-in-law, Thomas Hanna, who died in 1947. Johnny Erwin Strenzel, Carlotta Lottie Strenzel, daughter of Dr. John and Louisiana Strenzel. And then there was Henry Christian Strenzel, Dr. Strenzel's brother. Then there was a father-in-law of John Muir, Dr. John Theophil Strenzel. And then there was Louisiana Erwin Strenzel, who was the mother-in-law of John Muir, John Muir himself, and John Muir's wife. Now you can't see it, but right here at the entrance, uh, 1890, 18's on the other side, and 90 over here, and here they are, John Muir, buried right here, born Dunbar, Scotland, April 21st, 1838, he died Christmas Eve, 1914. When I visited the grave, I remembered that John Burroughs, one of America's foremost nature writers and good friends of Muir's, visited this grave site. The two formed a strong friendship in the 1890s. Burroughs accompanied Muir on the Alaska expedition led by Edward Harriman in 1899 and other trips, including visits to the Grand Canyon and Yosemite National Park. When Muir passed, his old friend visited his grave site. Burroughs himself died in 1921 and is buried in Roxbury, New York. Burroughs, who was a biographer of Walt Whitman and famous for his love of birds, wrote of Muir after their second meeting in 1896. Quote, he is a poet and almost a seer, something ancient and far away in the look of his eyes. He could not sit down in the corner of the landscape as Thoreau did. He must have a continent for his playground, probably the truest lover of nature we have had yet. But here is a little prolix. Ask him to tell you a famous dog story and you will get the whole story of glaciation thrown in. After Muir passed away, Burroughs said that he was a unique character, greater as a talker than as a writer. He loved personal combat and shone in it. He hated writing and composed with difficulty, though his books have charm of style. But his talk came easily and showed him at his best. I shall greatly miss him. So it looks like they're trying to make this uh, uh, maybe planted with some fruit trees, I'm not sure. But uh, all this was part of the Strenzel family fruit ranch. And uh, looks like they're trying to do some restoration down here. And it's right next to the, the graveyard here, the family graveyard right here. So I think it's pretty cool that I finally got to come here. I've been wanting to come here for quite a while. Always was scared off by reports that neighbors didn't like you even coming into this area. And if you did, you'd have to park a great distance away and walk in. But I'm pleased to know that they've made it a little easier for you to come and visit John Muir's grave. Uh, again, it was about six miles or six minutes from where we just visited. So apparently John Muir planted this sequoia tree right here 40 years before his death, which would have been about 1870, if I'm doing my math correctly. How cool is that? That something he planted is still living and perhaps these trees here as well. This one looks like a sequoia tree. They have something very nicely set up here for John Muir. And if you're ever in the area, if you would like to visit this place, I invite you to come along and uh, check it out. You might have to be creative about where you park though, because I don't think they really have established a parking lot here. They probably won't. We visited earlier the museum or the house, and uh, by one o'clock there was about 73 visitors, and I'm the only one here today checking out this grave. So I doubt if he gets very many visitors here as well. 
Hey, thank you for joining us today on this episode of History Enters. I hope that you have a greater appreciation for what John Muir meant to the national park system and for what he meant to the ecology of our planet, especially the national parks that we all love to go to today. If you could give us a thumbs up and give us a comment. Also, subscribe to History Hunters if you have not done so. Also, by hitting the notification bell, you will be notified just as soon as we post the next newest video. Thank you so much. Walked from Kentucky all the way to Florida. It was a journey of about a thousand miles that he wrote about. Damn. John Muir was all over the place. He explored the. John Muir was all over the place. He explored mansions. <laughs> now John, John Muir was all over the place in this world. He. John Muir. And thanks, John, for what you did to preserve our heritage and our nature's conscience. He's the one who helped preserve Yosemite National Park, which led to the...